We begin with the continuing crisis in Ukraine, where the Russian invasion continues as more troops pour into the country by the day and continued bombardment of many major cities, most notably the capital of Kyiv, continues. For more, let's bring in Weijia Zhang, Olivia Gazis, and Eliza Collins. Weijia is CBS News senior White House correspondent. Olivia, CBS News' intelligence and national security reporter. And Eliza is congressional reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Weijia, the White House is aiming to get $10 billion in emergency money to Ukraine. Where does that stand? We just heard of it today. Where do the efforts move from here? Well, the White House has formally requested that money um, to Congress. So it really depends on what lawmakers do at this point. But certainly we expect a lot of bipartisan support and not any big challenges to this, given the alternatives, which would be to do nothing. Um, and certainly both parties have indicated they are not interested in sending troops to the ground there or get involved in any other way militarily. So this is uh, something that um, I don't think I don't anticipate will be difficult. It is part of the budget talks already going on. So um, we know that the uh, the Office of Management and Budget submitted a formal request and the acting director, uh, Shalanda Young, wrote a blog post that sort of laid out the argument for why the money um, is needed right now. And just last week, the White House had uh, requested six point five, six point eight billion dollars, and then that figure ballooned to ten billion. So certainly, there's been an assessment that they need even more. As you mentioned at the top, there it will go toward military training, uh, more supplies, uh, and uh, more tactical things that Ukrainian soldiers can need. But it, a good chunk of it, Scott, will also go go, go toward providing um, humanitarian assistance to all the civilians of Ukraine who will certainly need it, especially um, as we see the tensions continue to rise uh, on Putin's part. And not happening in a vacuum. Members of both parties publicly saying we need to do more for the Ukrainians. That's the context in which the White House pushes for more aid. Olivia, let's talk about Russian money. Russia's invasion stepping up again today. How desperate is President Putin with his nation's economy crumbling and this war already taking longer than many in Russia may have expected. Well, Scott, that dwindling number of options that Vladimir Putin has at his disposal is actually stoking a lot of concern uh, because there's worry that he could start to resort to even more brutal and extreme tactics, if you can imagine that. Because you're right, in a week's work of, of fighting, uh, his military hasn't achieved any meaningful objective. His economy is in a tailspin. Uh, and a lot of the world is uniting to condemn his actions in Ukraine. There's a war crimes investigation being opened. And perhaps most crucially for Putin, the oligarchs and the elites that have long supported him are now starting to feel some significant pain. All of that is causing some observers to start to wonder if after 22 years in power, Putin's grip on it isn't starting to slip. That's probably still a long shot, but if this actually becomes existential for him, if he starts thinking it's either <laughs> Vladimir Zelensky or me, you'd better believe he's going to take all the steps that he thinks he needs to stake, step, take in order to come out on top. And that's what's causing worry, is that he could resort to leveling cities, using prohibited weapons, something worse if you can imagine it. Uh, that was sort of the essence of the readout from the call between French President Emmanuel Macron and Putin today, the uh, French president's office saying ominously that Macron believes the worst is to come. Eliza, for those of, those of us in the Capitol Hill press corps, this has been a week saturated with debate and talk about Russian oil and gas. So gas prices continue to rise by the day here in the U.S. What can Congress realistically do to combat that issue? Well, it's tough. And we're seeing sort of this bipartisan groundswell of support. There was a bill introduced today with a large number of bipartisan co-sponsors saying to cut off Russian oil, um, Russian oil imports to the U.S., which make a, a little bit less than 10 percent of our imports. The problem with that is that raises gas prices even further after they're already in an inflationary period. So Republicans argue that uh, the government should do that, and then Biden should roll back his regulations that he had put in place originally, things like banning drilling on um, public lands and end to the Keystone Pipeline. Now, Biden put those in place, of course, to combat climate change, but Republicans say they've long pushed for him to roll these back, but they're using basically this Russia-Ukraine crisis to say, 
that's a way to lower prices, to sort of up supply. Now, Democrats don't have that counter. They're saying this is an option. Uh, able to basically boost renewable energy that can take a little bit longer to build those things. But the truth is, if we are going to stop um, importing Russian oil and gas, which the White House has so far resisted, that could raise gas prices. That's not the only crisis, of course, the White House has had to face. The White House is shifting to a new phase in its response to the COVID pandemic, Ouija. What are they trying to do and how will they get the support they might need from Congress to do it? Well, again, they are requesting a huge uh, chunk of money, Scott, $22.5 billion, with an emphasis really on more vaccines and treatments. Um, instead of focusing so much on trying to prevent people from getting it, um, the shift here is, is giving people more options to deal with it if they do catch it and trying to view it as something other than, uh, you know, something as extreme and um, something that we are, are not clued in about anymore since we are now into year three of this. And so I think the administration is trying to shift that mindset and uh, allow people options for when they, if, I should say, if they do contract the virus. And so there's a lot of planning that, that they're hoping will happen with this additional um, money to test to treat, which is a big, um, uh, a big part of their new response strategy. So they are working with Pfizer and other manufacturers to develop uh, treatments and pills that people can take and basically get better right away, um, at least a lot quicker than they would without uh, this treatment. And they're also putting an emphasis on more research to deal with uh, any future variants that might spring up and um, making vaccines more available to the global community, which of course President Biden has stressed from day one, saying that you can't really think about an end to this pandemic unless everybody has access to protection. Uh, the, the difference here, Scott, uh, from the funding we were talking about with Ukraine is that I think that Republicans have uh, much less of an appetite for one, a figure this big and more money um, when, you know, they've already poured so much into this response and $22.5 billion is su substantial. Um, and so I know, you know, it, it's going to be a tougher fight for the administration. So perhaps they'll have to find ways to make it a smaller package in order to get at least uh, some of the money that they're requesting. Now, the good news for the White House is there are vehicles in Congress through which to get money to move in the next few weeks. Congress is approving money to keep the government open. Presumably, you could add COVID funding or foreign aid to that. So, Olivia, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the U.S. is open to a diplomatic path to end the war in Ukraine. But Anthony Blinken says talks are, seem to be heading nowhere with the Russians at this point. What would that look like? Right. Well, at the moment, diplomatic communication between the U.S. and Russia, except for a few key national security issues, is, is effectively severed. Nonetheless, the secretary and other officials have been at pains to say publicly, hey, Russia, the door to diplomacy remains open if you're interested in talking. That's in part because, especially in the hell of war, coordination and communication remains important. We saw today that even though the talks, the bilateral talks between the Ukrainians and the Russians didn't lead to any significant breakthroughs, uh, they seem to pave the way for the establishment of humanitarian corridors, which will presumably help civilians uh, get out of the country if they need to and help food and aid continue to flow. Now, there's some concern about that, of course, that it could be as the situation was in Syria, that these supposed corridors end up being either non-existent or exploited by the Russians to actually regroup and resupply themselves. But for the moment, the Ukrainians have said that there will be a third session of talks. And as long as the Russians continue to show up, there is this small glimmer of hope that they could notch their way towards something like a ceasefire. So here we are, the first full week of March. Eliza, that means we now begin midterm season, at least primary season. According to your reporting, there's a midterm primary race in South Carolina that's generating interest among the Republicans there. A freshman House member, Nancy Mace, fighting off a former GOP House candidate, Katie Arrington. Take us through why this race is such a significant one. 
Yes, so this is a Charleston area district. It's coastal South Carolina. It is a longtime Republican district that flipped in 2018, which was, if you guys will remember, a really good year for Democrats. They won back the House and flipped all sorts of seats across the country. But Joe Cunningham, a moderate Democrat, won the seat at the time by beating Katie Arrington. So now Arrington is running again to unseat Nancy Mace who won the seat in 2020, basically calling her, saying that she has separated too much from uh, former President Trump, who at this moment is really the leader of the GOP. But Mace is different than someone like Liz Cheney because she is really a reliable Republican vote. She worked for Trump's campaign in 2016. She voted for him in 20. I was at her house with her. She still has giant Trump campaign signs um, in her garage. But after January 6th, she said that Trump was to blame. And before or on January 6th, she voted to certify the election. She did not vote to impeach him. She has really not done much else to criticize Trump since, but she has said she stands by her criticism. And that might just be enough for some Trump supporters. So this is an interesting race because it's not a complete Trump critic. The question really is, can you criticize Trump at all and get through a primary? And then, of course, in the general election, this is seen as a somewhat competitive seat. And last month, Nancy Mace recorded a video, put it on social media to champion her support of former President Trump. Eliza Collins, Olivia Gazis, Weijia Zhang, thank you all.